Hi. Oh, we got to do that one again. You ready? Hi. Wow, that was great. It's so good to have you here. Whether you're watching online from somewhere in the world or whether you're down at our Kitchener campus, love you guys at the Kitchener campus, or whether you're at our Waterloo campus, we're delighted that you're here as we launch a brand new series called How to Train Your Brain. Can you say that with me, please? You ready? How to Train Your Brain. So we picked it up off of that movie called How to Train Your Dragon, and sometimes your brain's going to feel like a dragon, so maybe there's a bit of a connection there anyway. How to Train Your Brain your brain. You ready? It's a three week long series. And um, so I have some friends in the funeral home industry and they had an extra one of these brains laying around. So no, it's plastic. Come on. I wouldn't do that. And uh, it's kind of interesting. So this is, however, a representative. This is a life size adult human brain. Although fascinatingly enough, when our brains, when we grow as children and our heads reach the size they probably are now, Um, our brains are basically about the same size as a child's brain. It's a fascinating, fascinating thing. Our brains weigh about three pounds. So think about um, three blocks of 454 gram butter, jam it all together, and that's what you've got behind your eyes is this little guy here. Amazing, amazing brain. It's, It's quite large. I remember when I was a kid growing up, we used to have this little line we'd say to people, we were teasing them, we'd say, Well, the brains are made of dynamite. You wouldn't have enough to blow your nose. But the truth is, okay, that all our brains are pretty big and they're pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Did you know that the most complex structure known to mankind in the universe is your brain and my brain? That it is 86 billion neurons are inside your brain. And neurons have these extensions called axons and dendrites that are branch-like things and they go out from our brains and they interact with each other and they have all, make all these connections so that there are literally hundreds of trillions of connections inside your brain. In fact, if you, some of your cortical tissue, if you take it and you just have a cubic millimeter, okay, that's pretty small, a cubic millimeter of your cortic, cortical tissue contains 20 times more connections than there are people on planet Earth. It's pretty amazing how complex and awesome our brains are, what they are made of and and how they work. They're they're actually about 60% fat. In fact, your brain is the fattiest organ in your body. So when someone says to you, hey, fathead, what they're actually doing is not picking on you, okay? They're actually just making a biologically accurate statement. So don't get upset with what they're saying, right? It's pretty, pretty amazing what they do. And what's interesting about our brains, too, is that they're, they're, they're constantly changing. We call this brain plasticity or neuroplasticity. In fact, if you're watching online when you started this service, when you end this service, you're in Kitchener, start the service, end the service, in Waterloo, start the service, end the service, your brain is actually physiologically going to be different from the time you walked in to the time you leave. It'll change, it'll morph, it'll shift. And that's a beautiful thing, I'll tell you why it is in a minute. Our brains are incredible gifts from God. Now what's interesting is that there are some like pre-programming that happens in our brains, right? So that when we're born, there are certain things that we can automatically do. Um, For animals in particular, it's really fascinating because they can do some things that we can't do. Some things that God has programmed into their brains at birth. So for example, take a baby giraffe. The baby giraffe is born, and as soon as it's born, it drops six feet onto the ground. Boom, okay? Aren't you glad that doesn't happen to us? Bang, that's a rude awakening, right? And um, the mom will reach over and she'll clean, him up, clean up the little gaffer. And he's, he's, he's actually over 200 pounds, so he's not really a little gaffer. And he's, he's about my height, so he's six feet tall. So what happens, though, do you know what the giraffe does right away? Right away, it tries to stand up. So automatically, right away, it's trying to stand up. Why? Because God has programmed its brain so that automatically, as it's been growing in the womb, it's developed the muscle tissue that's necessary and the length, strength in the legs, but also this deep desire to stand up and to know how to manipulate the limbs and the head and everything at least in some chaotic matter at first so that it understands how to do this. It's just implanted. It's kind of like hardwired. It's downloaded software, as, you would, as it would, so that after about 30 minutes, this little guy can stand up. 
go over to his mom, get a drink, and move because predators will get him if he can't really do that. Now, we don't have that as humans. We don't seem to have that pre-programming in there. And it's kind of a cool thing. It's a good thing. I mean, can you imagine me in the, in the hospital and a little six-and-a-half-year-old baby just goes delightfully, joyfully screaming down the hallway while the nurses are chasing him, right? I mean, it wouldn't be a good thing. I mean, as parents, you wouldn't want to bring a baby home and, with the thing already able to walk, right? I mean, that's going to, ah, I just got to get used to how to change a diaper, let alone chase it around the house. So for human beings, this isn't how it works. Now, God has done this in some incredible ways in all kinds of different animals. For example, birds know how to build a nest. They didn't go to school for that. And they figure out, you know what? I think the snowbirds from Canada going to Florida is a good idea. I'm going down. That's pre-programmed in them. There's some fascinating things that God has done. But for us as human beings, we don't seem to have some of those things in there. Now, we can blink when we're born. We can move our eyes. We can hear our hearts beating, our livers functioning, and all of those things are going on. But there's a lot more space for neoplasticity to take place. For us to learn things and to grow in that way in our minds. And in fact, it's our responsibility to care for that brain that we have. Because the truth of the matter is that there are all kinds of influences and stimuli and voices that are coming into our world. And we have a responsibility because God has given us this brain to care for it. And to use this organ in a wonderful way in our lives. But when you think about all the voices that are coming at us. News media, voices from friends, movies that we watch, books that we read, experiences that we go through, interaction with our friends and maybe those people we wouldn't call our friends. All of those experiences come in at us and they seek to shape our brains. And we have a responsibility to respond to those in an appropriate manner. And that's what this series is really all about. Some of the voices, some of the stimuli, some of the inputs are good and healthy and right, and we, we want to embrace those and grab a hold of those. But some of them are not so. Some of them can hurt us. Some of, us can, some of them can shape our lives in ways that are damaging. And all of us know that because all of us have allowed that to happen in our lives. Now, what I want to do today is talk about a particular influence that comes into our hearts, comes into our lives, seeks to shape our brains that we need to be really, really careful of. It's someone that Jesus talks about. And if you've got a Bible and you want to turn to John chapter 4, um, excuse me, John chapter 8, turn to John chapter 8. We're going to look at verse 44. And in John chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus gives expression, identifies this particular influence in our lives and talks about how to respond or understand this, how to realize what is going on in our lives. Now, the context is interesting. Jesus is talking to a group of people here, and some of them absolutely hate him. The text tells us that they want to kill him. So this is not your friendly you know, backyard barbecue that's happening here. And because these people want to kill him, Jesus speaks to these people. You know, Jesus is often very tender in the way that he talks, but sometimes not so much. So if you turn to John 8 or turn on, depending on what kind of device you have, John chapter 8, I want to look at the verse. I'm going to put it up on the screen here. So here's Jesus speaking to these people who hate him, who want to kill him, and listen to what he says. You, you belong to your father, the devil. That's pretty much in your face, right? You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. There is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus comes along to these men, and he says essentially to them, you've had someone influence you. And this someone who has influenced you, I want to tell you, is the devil. And he's influenced you in a dramatic way. And I want to tell you how he's influenced you. Now, what he's saying to these men here who hate him is a teaching, some teaching that you and I can learn about how to respond to this influence, this particular influence, influencer in our lives. So here's the first thing that we get from Jesus' teaching, or there's a number of things. One of them is that Jesus teaches us that there is a devil. Jesus teaches us that there is a devil. The Greek word here is diabolos. Probably heard that word before. It means 
It can also be understood to be the accuser. It's someone who comes at others to hurt them. That's what it's all about. And, and the Bible's really clear in its teaching, and Jesus embraces that and says, hey, time out. First thing I want you to understand when it comes to how to train your brain is that there is someone I'm calling the devil, Diabolos. Now, it's interesting because in, in, in the Bible, there are all kinds of sort of, of titles that are given to this being. He's called Satan, the evil one, the tempter, the destroyer, the deceiver, the great dragon who deceives the whole world, the ancient serpent who leads the whole world astray. And it's fascinating because some scholars have looked at this list, this kind of mosaic of, of, of titles for him and said, and Jesus doesn't do it either. There's no real personal name here. And it's kind of like Jesus isn't giving the devil any kind of a plug here. He's kind of pushing back and saying, I'm not going to give you a name. I'm just going to kind of describe you. And some other scholars have said, it's kind of like Jesus is saying, he who shall not be named. Okay. Um, I'm just going to give you the labels for him as if he's that dark and that bad. When you look at Jesus teaching around the devil, here's what you discover, is to Jesus, the devil is an immaterial but real intelligence and cunning source of evil. And the most powerful and influential creature on earth. When we look into the Bible, one of the things we see is kind of like a mosaic of, 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 of stories and teaching and parables and so on to give us some concept of who this creature is. And as we put them all together, we come up with something like this, that he was created by God, that he sat at one time on God's divine counsel. We're not sure all that that means. There's, it seems evidence from scripture that that's true, that he's the animating energy behind many of the greatest atrocities of history. Think about that for just a minute. That's, that's, that's this, this, the history. We look at history, look what's going on, and he's been the influencer in that in some ways. Jesus came to destroy his work and to bind him. One of the reasons Jesus came is, is to rescue us, but to do something with this being called the devil. Jesus' victory on the cross was like D-Day to World War II. So D-Day to World War II was the beginning of the end of World War II. Jesus' cr cross experience was the beginning of the end for the devil, okay? The decisive battle that marked the beginning of the war's end. And when Jesus returns, the devil and his ilk will be cast into the lake of fire. So Jesus teaches us there is this being called the devil. And in light of our series, he has some influence on our brains. Now you may be saying to me, come on, Ken, it's like 2021. Like, really? You believe like there's this being called the devil? Um, come on. And I realize that for many of us, we've been baked in materialism, which basically means that there is no other reality except what you can touch and see. The primary reason that I believe the devil exists is because Jesus believes he exists, and Jesus teaches that. And because Jesus does that, and I'm a follower of Jesus, I want to believe the same thing. And because Jesus believes that, and because Jesus teaches that, I need to be careful of this influencer in my brain, what he wants to do in my life. There's a, a, a villain in a Hollywood movie who had this interesting statement. He said, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. And perhaps that's more true than we want to admit. But one of the things Jesus teaches us in this passage in John 8, is that there is a being called a devil the most powerful and influential being on planet earth. Number two, Jesus teaches the devil's mission is to spread death. You remember what he said here, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. What does a murderer do? He wants to destroy life. He wants to kill. In fact, Jesus in John chapter 10 will expand on this when he says the thief, again speaking of the devil, the thief comes only to, watch this now, steal, kill, destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. So Jesus is saying, if you look at the devil over here, he comes to steal things, to kill things, to destroy things. That's his mission in life. 
I have come to give you life and give it to you to the full. So you can see that we have these two opposite beings on two distinctly different missions. And we are in the middle, okay, between those two. For Jesus, the devil is the archetype of a villain who is hell-bent on destruction. He wants to watch the world burn. His motto is tear it all down. Wherever he finds life, he tries to stamp it out. Beauty, deface it. Love, corrupt it. Unity, fragment it into a million pieces. Human flourishing, push it to anarchy or tyranny. Either will do. His anti-life, pro-death, pro-chaos agenda is to him an insatiable fire. This is what he's trying to do. So Jesus teaches there is a devil. Jesus teaches that the devil's mission is to spread death. And I want to look at the third one. We're going to hang around here for the rest of the morning. The third thing that Jesus teaches, which is so critical to this series, is this. Jesus teaches the devil's strategy is lies. I'm wondering if you could read number three out with me out loud. Can you do that? You ready? Jesus teaches the devil's strategy is lies. The primary way he works, the most strategic attack that he has on us the number one approach to ruining to killing and stealing and destroying is this thing called lying in fact look at how jesus describes it you belong to your father the devil and you want to carry out your father's desires he was a murderer from the beginning not holding to the truth for there is no truth in him watch this when he lies he speaks his native language for he is a liar and the father of lies it's kind of cute what Jesus says if I could put it that way some translations have when you speak your when he speaks his mother tongue it's called lie and in many ways what we're going to do is we're going to have a little bit of a study on lieology okay for the next couple of minutes and you're not going to find that word anywhere because I invented it <laughs> not that that matters much lieology okay now here's what you've got what, what Jesus what is Jesus saying to us his primary strategy his way of messing up you in your life and your walk with God in any way else is primarily through lying. He is a liar. Now, oftentimes when we think about spiritual warfare, we can tend to move into the direction where we think that spiritual warfare can be a little spooky. We talk about exorcisms. We talk about all of that. And I'm not trying to downplay that superstitious stuff and so on and so on and so on. But I want to say that sometimes we may, sometimes we may be out of balance Spiritual warfare is primarily a war against lying. It's primarily a war to fight for truth. What is spiritual warfare? Is it at heart a war against lies? It is a fight for truth. And you and I are in this war with a being whose strategy is to lie to you. Because by lying to you, he can get you to turn away from what is the truth and he can mess us up royally. That's what he does. You remember what Jesus says a little bit earlier in this very chapter? To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you what? Will set you what? Will set you, will set you free. And isn't that what we want? We want our lives to flourish, and Jesus wants that same experience for us. Here's the devil, kill, steal, Destroy. Here's Jesus saying, I want you to know life. I want you to flourish. I want you to know that freedom. So how does the devil lie to us? I want to look at three ways that he does it, okay? Way number one that he lies to us is in temptation. Can you say that word? What's the word? The word is temptation. Did you know that the heart of temptation is to lie? That's it. Every time you're tempted to do wrong, let's talk about temptation being the lure to do what is morally wrong or to not do what is morally right. To, to do the lure to disobey God's commands. Every time that you're tempted, you're being lied to. Every single time. You are listening to a lie or a combination of lies. How many of you like to be lied to? Anybody here? Yeah. Looking forward to being lied to today. Yeah. That'll make our relationship much more tighter in our family and at work. We don't think that way, right? I mean, lying is one of the worst things you can do because it separates you. It's distancing itself from you. And yet what's clear in Scripture is that Satan's primary, strat primary strategy is to lie to us. It's called temptation. 
And it is what he's doing. So I can be lied to all the time. It's okay if you do that, Ken. It's going to be fun. Nobody's going to catch you. Go to that website. It's okay. Say that thing about that other person. It's all fine. And what, what happens to us is if we would slow down enough and stop, we could actually look at the temptation and go, okay, what is the lie here? What are the lies here? Because if I could go back and discover and identify the lies, it might help me not do what I know I shouldn't be doing. There is a lie or a combination of lies that is designed by the devil to get us to act in a way that violates what God wants us to do. Happens all the time. When I was in grade seven, I got hanging around with a bunch of kids who were not the best kind of group of people to hang around with. My parents would have known they would have stopped it right away. These particular guys, one of the things they loved to do was to break into houses. I know, grade seven, that's who I was hanging out with. And so one of the things that we did was we broke into houses. Did I know it was wrong? Duh, yes I did. Why did I do it? It'll be fun. No one will catch us. It'll be brave. You can do it. Were those lies? Yeah. Was it fun? Yeah. <laughs> Until we got caught. <laughs> did we get caught? Yeah. Until it, you know, that's what happens to us. You do those kinds of things. I remember being at home and the police officers come to the house and they're saying to, my, saying to me, brought me into the kitchen, sat me there. My dad on one side, the police officer across the table there, I'm sitting there. My mom's in the other room bawling. And the police officer is saying to me, did you do this? Guess what I did? I lied. No, I didn't do it. It was those guys. I would never do that. You know why I lied? Because I thought I could lie and get away with it. You know why else I lied? Because my dad was sitting there, and if he found out I did it, I was in big trouble. And I was more afraid of my dad than I was a police officer. If you knew my dad, you'd agree with me. You didn't know you wouldn't agree with me. It wasn't the right thing to do. But you notice how you do that? And eventually, of course, I had to tell the truth, and I got it out there. And, and, and what happens to you and to me when we are being lured into temptation is that ultimately its power is the power of a lie. Crazy, isn't it? So what we need to be doing is asking ourselves, what's the lie here? What's the lie or the lies? And why am I believing them? Why am I following this? Because it only leads to steal, kill, and destroy. And ultimately, I believe the lie, I do the act, and what happens is that I become a slave to it. I, I, I can go to that website, it's okay. I can, I can stop anytime I want to. I can go to that website, it's okay, nobody's gonna know. I can spread this little gossip about this person. It's okay, because I, I think they deserve it. I, I can take this thing. I, I can cheat on my income tax. I can, I can do this. It's okay. And we come up and we hear all these lies. If I do this, if I do this, if I do this, if I do this, I can get away with it. It's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. Da, 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 da. And what it is, is that heart a lie. And it leads to a dark and difficult place. Because not only does Satan lie in temptation, that's really his strategy, but he lies in what we call accusation. Can you say that word with me, please? You ready? Accusation. Accusation. So here's what happens, okay? The temptation comes. I yield to the temptation. I sin. And either immediately or shortly after or even years down the road, there's this guilt that comes on me, this weight that what I did was wrong, that what I did was a violation of what it means for me as a follower of Jesus. And Satan in that moment, with the weight of accusation, starts saying things to me like, you blew it again, Ken. You keep saying you're gonna take care of that area and you blew it one more time. Do you know what? You're never gonna get out of it. Do you know what? I don't think God loves you like you should. You're gonna go actually go up and stalk, talk in front of people about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Look at you. You're not what you should be. You're far away from what God would have you to be. And over and over again, there's this accusation that takes place in my life. If the lie in temptation is to get you to sin, the lie in accusation is that your, spirit, your, your situation is hopeless because you sinned. And over and over again, I've seen people who have felt the weight of this in their lives, that they blew it and that they're not going to ever get out of that thing and that they can't move beyond it, that it has destroyed them. And I want to tell you that this is beautiful, amazing, spectacular news that Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, came to earth and said, 
You're gonna listen to the liar and you're gonna submit to the liar. You're gonna do what the liar says and I am never gonna do that. I am never gonna submit to him. I know it's a lie. I will never bend to his, his call on my life. But I will take all your wrongs on me. I will take all the pain and the guilt of your sin on me on the cross. I will take it. I will do it for you so that you can be absolutely clean and forgiven by God himself. So Jesus does that and he dies and he's buried. He rises again. He says to all of us, it's all taken care of. So do I feel the weight of what I've done wrong? Absolutely. What do I need to do? I need to confess. I'm sorry, God, for what I've done. I'm sorry. And know that it's all taken care of in Jesus. So the lie that the accuser puts on me to say, you're you're messed up, you're never going to change, you're caught in this, it's not going to be any different, I don't have to listen to him anymore. I can say, yeah, it's a struggle, and yeah, I might mess up again, but I'm all taken, it's all taken care of, I'm completely forgiven in Jesus, and I want to live a life that doesn't sit underneath your lies. Temptation is at heart a lie. When I'm tempted, I want to ask, what are the lie? What is the lie or what are the lies? Accusation is at heart a lie. God has rejected you. You can't, you can never get out of this. You're a terrible person. How can you do this? How can God love you? How can anybody love you? You need to isolate yourself. I can say that's not true. Yes, I messed up. I'm going to do what I need to do that's right. And I'm going to trust God's forgiveness in Jesus. And I'm going to trust him and believe his truth over your lies. One more area. Act temptation, accusation, misinformation. Can you say that with me, please? Misinformation, misinformation. So we have to ask the question, what is truth? What is the truth? And I'd like to submit that the truth is reality. That when something is true, it's real. When something is false or a lie, it's not real. So so when we think about misinformation, I believe that one of the things that Satan does, that the devil does, is to provide misinformation. If he can get us to believe what's not true, what's not real, he can get us to be distant from what is real, and that's what we need to be embracing in our brains, right? So let me just share with you a couple, a number of examples. Uh, There is no God. There's no God. That's misinformation. It's a lie. Now, either there is a God or there isn't a God. You can't have both. If there is God, I'm going to live my life in one way. If there isn't a God, I'm going to live my life in a totally other way. Can't hedge bets, right? So that kind of misinformation is out there everywhere. The Bible, you can't understand everything in it, right? So the Bible, the Bible's got so many problems with it. It's just a fairy tale. It's just a myth. That's misinformation. What do you do with that? You have to make a decision. Am I going to trust that what God says about the Bible is true or am I not going to trust what it's true, says is true? How about values in our world today? Talk about misinformation. People, we have a culture that is chasing stuff and money at fame and position at the cost of their personal spiritual lives. At the cost sometimes of relationships. Talk about misinformation. It comes in the media. It comes in music. It comes in movies. All the time. Misinformation about who we are as people. We're just just material. No, we're not just material. And talk a little bit more about this next week. If you believe you're just material, then you're going to act in a certain way. But if you believe you're more than that, you're going to act in a different way. Our morals, our sexual morals, which misinformation, oh, you just need to sleep with everybody who you can until you find the right person to marry them. And the Bible comes along and goes, don't do that. Don't do that. Misinformation. Misinformation is everywhere. And this is one of the things that Satan is really good at. And what we need to do is we need to say, okay, is there a lie here? Or are there lies here? What are the lie or lies here? And how do those lie and lies line up with what the Bible says? And that needs to be the key thing that we need to understand. Jesus is saying to us, you need to be really careful. You need to be really careful. Temptation is at heart a lie or lies. Accusations towards you that put you other than where you are in Christ are lie or lies. Misinformation out there that pushes back against what scripture says is a lie or lies. Proverbs puts it this way, be careful what you think because your thoughts run your life. 
Be careful what you think because your thoughts run your life. So we need to be very careful. There's someone who's lying to us, who wants more and more for us to not think correct thoughts. So here's Jesus. And, and, and Jesus says to us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am. I am. And over here is the devil. You know what the devil says? I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's exactly what he says to us. And if you will do what I want, you will experience that truth, way, and life. But you won't <laughs> because he's a liar. And he can't lead you there. So what you and I need to do is we need to make that decision that we are going to listen to and follow and embrace and believe Jesus as the truth, the way, and the life. And we're going to ask him to help us to discern more wisely when temptation comes, where's the lie? Now that I've labeled it, it's more difficult for me to embrace the lie. Where's the accusation toward me, God? I know that you love me, that you've forgiven me. I'm going to rest in that. It's not because of what I've done. It's because of what you've done. Where's the misinformation? Where does it stand against what Scripture says? How am I going to respond in that way? You and I have got this amazing organ inside our heads called our brains. And it's under attack. And it's under attack by lies. And we need to make sure that we allow God to do what he wants to do in our lives so we can be the kind of people who have our thoughts the way they need to be because that will drive how we live our lives and that will enable us to experience freedom that Jesus calls on us and offers us to know. Will you bow your heads with me, please? Heavenly Father, all of us, have listened to and embraced the lies. And we found out later that what we had done has really messed us up. And we don't want to go there anymore. We know we're not perfect. We know we're going to keep listening to the wrong stuff. But we ask that you'd help us to be smarter, to be savvier, to listen to you, to bring your truth into our minds so that we then can, in fact, live a life that honors you in every way. And so I just pray, Lord, I pray for people who right here are on the verge of doing something that ultimately is rooted in a lie or lies that, Lord, they would stop right now. The idea that it might be fun, that it might be better, that they might get blessed, which is part of that lie package, pull that away, Lord. Help them to trust you in this. For some who are here are feeling the weight of listening to lies that have left their lives scarred and they're limping, I pray, Heavenly Father, that they might know the, the forgiveness that comes from you and not allow the liar to continue to accuse them. And for those of us who maybe, Father, have been pulled into some misinformation about you and about life and about values and about morals and so on and so forth, I pray that we would turn back again and trust you deeply for that. Thank you for being a God who wants to and does, in fact, care for us in every way. And may our lives reflect that for your glory. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen? God bless.